welcome to Thrive Talks, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, we're talking with Jennifer Luke from the University of Southern Queensland about the UN Sustainable Development Goal 8, which is to promote sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work for all. Jennifer has a PhD in vocational psychology and career development with a strong interest in generational diversity and skills retention within the workforce. Jennifer is currently a research fellow at the University of Southern Queensland. SDG 8 calls for full productive employment and decent work. So does that mean that the goal is for everybody to have a full-time 40-hour work week? When it comes to decent work, what people are looking for in work is is that that everybody has uh, equal opportunity. And it's about being able to have sustainable work. So if it's, a, you know, a full time work through the week, if that's what someone's requiring, then definitely um, decent work. But it really is looking at everybody has that opportunity to be able to gain uh, meaningful employment. Uh, and of course, that is financial as well. So, uh, yes, you are correct, is that that would be, you know, to gain that full time work. But in some cases, it might be that someone is only looking for flexible hours, but they still want to have that uh, ability to find that work. So that's why um, decent work. It's really covering all aspects of what someone is seeking in terms of employment. Okay, so it's going to be dependent on an individual's needs. As we are moving forward at the moment, um, there have been countries that are trialing things like four day work week and scaling back hours. Does that is that included in SDG eight? Is that something that UN is pushing for? In terms of the sustainable development goal, um, mm-hmm. I went around that decent work, it is looking at again making sure that everybody has that opportunity to find uh, the employment that they're seeking. And in terms of countries that are looking at that four-day work week, they are still looking at that as providing the full-time employment for people and to be able to provide them uh, the financial uh, need that they have. So in terms of a four-day work week with uh, different countries, it is looking at as long as they are providing that inclusive environment and that they're providing the opportunity for people to to find the work that they're seeking uh, for what they're needing, including financial, uh, yes, it would be decent work. Right. So, yeah, um, with with the financial, you mean that they still get paid the same amount and the productivity, I believe, is that the same levels. It's just that strictly the hours that they're working is reduced in those cases. Yes, there's countries. Uh, one good example is Iceland mm-hmm. uh, that was in the media quite a bit uh, in 2021 uh, as being one of those countries that had successfully trialed a four day work week. And when you look closely at what they did, it was a a case of they added an additional hour onto each workday. They wanted to make sure that that productivity still stayed strong and that people were still putting in the hours that would provide them a full-time wage. But it was allowing them to have that flexibility of an additional day that they could work on. In this case, uh, it was a lot of people working within government um, in Iceland. And so that additional day was provided as a chance to do a professional development, but also, you know, for caregiving. And they found that productivity went through the roof. Because people went, well, in those four days, we're going to get done everything that we need to get done because then I've got that extra day in the week that I can focus on those other areas. So in that case, it's more about flexibility and maintaining that work-life balance for people. Definitely. Uh, As as you said uh, just beforehand is everyone, you know, has different needs and It is a case of there's a lot of people that are working and wanting to study or are studying at the moment, and it is finding 
that balance because it's it's pretty tough when you've got to try and find some extra hours in the week to be able to fit that study in. But of course, caregiving is a big one too, uh, yeah. which can be either parental, but you know, there's many other forms of caregiving uh, that people are involved in. And it allows them to be able to do that, but also be able to complete a full-time job and keep that financial side going. So it, again, what you said before about decent work, it definitely ties in with this because it's about being aware of the needs of your workforce and providing them opportunity. Have these sorts of conversations about work-life balance increased um, due to the experience of lockdown and remote work? I believe it has. Uh, I can say from a localised point of view, uh, when I was working um, up until recently within a careers team uh, at the University of Southern Queensland and at another uni that I worked at previously, the students that you were talking to, even before uh, COVID, it was more and more prevalent where people would be saying, I have these responsibilities outside of my study or outside of my work or where I want to be heading in my career. And I need to find a bit of balance here. And remote working and remote learning has definitely factored into that as well. Uh, because a lot of universities, um, including the one that I'm at at the moment, have a very large number of their student base not actually located even in the same state. They're interstate or even overseas. And so definitely there is that uh, balance because you could be working or studying in a completely different time zone. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, yes, I, I think that factored in. And, of course, with everybody in lockdown around the world at different times, and that there was one time when the whole world was seemed to be in lockdown all at the same time. Yeah. We all jumped online uh, and it really did make people start to realise that they needed to find a balance. Um, what kind of benefits are there to employers in providing that kind of hybrid or flexible work system? I think from an employer's point of view, it can be a little bit scary to be thinking about providing flexibility because you can immediately go to that thought of, if I do that, everyone's going to run right. But the thing about... Uh, providing that flexibility. And look, I can use Iceland again, Uh, even though it's a tiny little country, it's actually got a very productive workforce and it's got a a very productive older workforce uh, because they are very inclusive with uh, their workforce. And what they found was that when they provided that flexibility by allowing people to have that extra day that they could do something else, their, the productivity went up. And so it really is about having, from an employer's point of view, as long as you've got a structure or a policy in place, listening to your staff and finding out, you know, if there is a staff member that really is not working at the level of productivity and it's very obvious that they have other concerns outside of work that they need to be there for, again, could be family, Uh, it could be study, is that looking at how you could provide a more flexible approach uh, and they would probably be pleasantly surprised about the productivity of that staff member going up uh, because you've taken that stress off them. Do you think that that also plays into um, disadvantaged workers who might have uh, certain disabilities or just in general be unable to fit neatly into the structured life of, of work as we know it thus far, um, do you think that that will help offer those opportunities to, to those people? Yes, uh, very much uh, with that SDGA, looking at decent work, it's about having that inclusive approach to workforce development and looking at it from a, a disability employment uh, side of things and uh, or anything where something else is impacting on someone's ability to be able to work at full time uh, in like a nine to five job, five days a week, then definitely it is about looking at how they can still provide 
you know, that level of productivity, but it will be looking at it from a different approach. So it definitely, with that decent work, it's about factoring in the needs of uh, staff, of employees, and looking at what skills they're bringing, what experience they're bringing, what attitude they're bringing. If you've got a very a proactive person that really wants to, you know, give their all to a job, but they cannot do nine to five for whatever reasons, or that they need to have assistance uh, to be able to perform uh, in that role. It's looking at if that attitude is there, you want to encourage it. There are scales where productivity has increased significantly, but wage growth hasn't risen to match Mm -hmm. that while the cost of living, of course, has gone up. Does that mean that like, we should be introducing measures like minimum wages um, or even the universal basic incomes to sort of change how we're looking at work entirely? Well, that I have to admit that question is one that's asked a lot. Yeah. And it's one that I think every government looks at and goes, that's the too hard basket. Uh, is, but it, I think one thing there is at least, you know, from a universal wage, uh, I'd probably say one thing about Australia is that there is an award, uh, you know, is that for every job uh, there, you know, there is a, a rate. A lot of them should be higher um, and like there's, that's the whole thing. But at least there's something you can work from that you can build upon is that a, uh, a particular industry sector, if they're wanting a, uh, a rise in their wages, at least everyone knows that they're at that same rate so that they can request that early. Other countries uh, don't have an award. Um, and, it, you know, for those countries, um, I'm thinking like in hospitality where they're, they're reliant on tips, for example. Yeah. Yeah, so that for ex- that would be where I would be saying they need to at least be starting with something similar to how Australia has with that award rate so that everybody has that same level. So talking about minimum wage as its own thing, what kind of effects do we see in places that have a higher minimum wage versus a lower minimum wage or no minimum wage at all? If you're working in a country that doesn't have a rate, like a minimum wage, mm-hmm. um, and that there isn't a standard, you know, I'll use the award again, but if you're working in one of those countries, and there's a lot of country, a lot of Western countries that don't have an award, uh, and the thing is, is that it really does impact on uh, a worker because they're having to, as I said, if it's hospitality, they're having to rely on tips, uh, and that's, Uh, is stressful enough because they know that um, each day that they're working, it might not be the same amount that they're bringing home. Uh, So that, again, you know, that's where uh, decent work, it's not happening. At least if somebody in um, any job, in an entry-level job, if they can step into it and know that what they're stepping into, this is the rate it's at. Uh, at least they know that, okay, that's what they're getting. And it also helps you when you're looking at other avenues of where you can go, whether it's, you know, into a higher level within that current job, or if you're looking at other industries. Um, When you look at a job ad in Australia, the salary that you see, um, a lot of the time you'll see the actual award rate stated. Right. Um, And that's, you can go online and immediately find out what that is. Uh, so I would say it's good that way because at least you've got an idea of what is being offered um, as a wage. You, an idea of your own value as well. It um, is. Based on yes. your skills, yeah. Definitely, yeah. With that minimum wage, what would you say to employers who are saying that they can't afford to pay their employees a minimum wage? If an employer was saying that they couldn't afford to pay the minimum wage, they have to be questioning themselves about what are you needing in your workforce and what productivity are you expecting? Now, I know that if you're looking at countries around the world, uh, the whole point of decent work is ensuring that they've got that safety, they've got that financial, uh, you know, it's it's both a physical and mental 
um, safety there. Uh, yeah. So for an employer, if they're wanting, you know, 20 people um, to be working for them, but they don't want to pay them that rate, um, you know, the minimum wage, well, I know it's happening a lot in many countries. And that's the whole reason for um, that sustainable development goal, eight, for decent yeah. work. So the goal is to basically eliminate that kind of exploitation of, of people and it is. And the whole point of the SDGs too is that governments uh, from every country uh, report to the UN on how they're going with the SDGs. Mm-hmm. Anyone can see looking at the reports that come in through the UN how countries are going with decent work. And uh, if you look at any country that is reporting on this, you will find uh, publications that they're doing and reports on what's happening in their workforce so really what the UN's done, they've put um, industry on notice. Well, I mean, it's it's about a living wage, isn't it? Being able to afford yeah. to live. If you can't, obviously, if, if your employees can't afford to live, then they're not going to be able to continue to work. That is. And, and decent work is about stopping exploitation um, in the workforce. But Again, you know, a, a, around the world, the reason it was created was to hold countries accountable and, and to start looking at how they can ensure that every worker is provided opportunity and no matter the job that they're doing, they still have that physical and mental security. Right. Um, yeah, so really that is uh, what this is all about. And, the real um, emphasis on the decent aspect of decent it, work. It there. is, and that's what yeah, that's and that's what decent is 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 providing uh, that security for every single person, and and it's to stop exploitation. Speaking about that exploitation level, I do know that in Australia, for example, migrant workers aren't afforded the same protections as um, citizens. What can we do to protect those vulnerable demographics from that exploitation? Here in Australia, no matter what the job that you're doing, it should be attached to an award. Now, I know that you can do casual hours and I know that uh, with international students, exploitation can happen. It's a big topic. That's the thing. We yeah, it is, of course, into. yes. Uh, but if you're looking at what decent work is all about, and really looking at that the sustainable development goal, that is what you can go back to when wanting to highlight, and this can be if you're needing to highlight what's happening um, with a government policy or needing to highlight um, in, a, in a program that's been put forward, even like for a not-for-profit about, you know, how to assist those that might be in that situation. It, it's the perfect goal to connect in with and unpack. Um, right. On that. So it, it's about holding the governments accountable, basically, for what's going on under their purview. The governments have to report on these goals and, and what they're doing. And if you want to frame an argument around uh, something that you're advocating for, anything that's coming from the UN, it's universal. It's, it's across all countries. And yeah. it's something that uh, governments are very aware of. I would just say for anything that you felt you really needed to advocate for in that space. Using the goals is definitely a way to build an argument around yep. and to advocate. That's great. But how, how can workers best protect their own rights to, to that decent and safe work when you see giant companies like Amazon working really hard to prevent any kind of unionization? A lot of the big companies around the world where, or, or, and it doesn't have to be big companies, it can be, you know, small companies as well, but all around the world where people are working and they're being exploited. It really comes down to, in a lot of cases, that job that, per, you know, those workers are needing, you know, for different reasons, that job they are needing right there and then. Uh, I think really the thing to consider is that, if a company or a small business or an employer who's got people working, if they're going to exploit those uh, workers by not paying them a decent wage, well, of course, yeah, it, it, it's unethical. Uh, and all I can really say at this point is if they are within a country that has an award or something similar, 
then there are avenues you can take to highlight that they're breaking the law basically yeah uh, but in other areas it really is is that if there are people who want to stand up and advocate for those workers again it is about you know the sustainable development goals looking at um, the decent work it's the place to start now have you heard anything about the anti-work movement or the the great resignation that is something that came out of i believe it was america it, it initially came from and i know within the career sector it's definitely been um discussed quite a bit yep I, the thing I would probably say is that um, it's not something new that's just cropped up during COVID, but I do believe that um, the lockdown and just what people have experienced over the last couple of years, I think a lot of people just started to consider what really was meaningful to them work-wise. Right, of and course. So I think this has probably been the catalyst, uh, but with the great resignation, I mean, it does sound very ominous coming in and I think it really is a lot of people not so much that everyone's going I quit uh, but it's definitely made a lot of people go I might start exploring some other options it's making employers stop and think too about how they approach things um, with the workforce so you might see a few more four-day work weeks popping up you never know do you think that there are certain industries that are more vulnerable to issues like for safety regulations or wage theft All I would probably say is any work that is reliant on a casual workforce, that would be the one that really you would need to make sure is being regulated. It's about regulating um, all the industry sectors. But again, all I can say is the fact that there's a global goal um, with that decent work, it's a good starting point for anything at all that people want to build an advocacy around. Now, I have heard a lot of talk that the gig economy where people are working for like platforms like Uber or something where they're not necessarily considered employees and, and people mm-hmm. having increasingly insecure employment, um, it, is that the future of, of work? Are we going to shift more towards that style of employment? No. Uh, look, I, I do believe there, there's a lot of industry sectors that – have gone to more Mm -hmm. contract-based or Uh, casual-based. There's a lot of industries where it's a lot harder to find a permanent full-time job. And, of course, you know, depending on the needs of a person where they might need to have that permanency in a role uh, because of different reasons, it could be because you're looking for a home loan where you might be expected, look, you need to have a permanent job. Things are changing in that space, though, as well. But... It really comes down to, yes, work can become more uh, unsecure, but I think also that employees, this is a good time to start thinking about taking control of what you're wanting to do with um, your career as well. You might have to um, take jobs for financial reasons, but It's also looking at while you're working in a particular job, which might be, you might feel is unsecure, while you're in that job, looking at where this job could potentially open up other opportunities, which might mean because of people you've met, or it could be because of um, other avenues within that company or in other areas, in other sectors. So I think even when you're in jobs where you feel as though I can't stay here because it's not permanent it you know it I could have the the rug pulled out from underneath me at any time it can still open up opportunities keep your eyes open never never think that you can't be looking for opportunities I think that's the thing and no matter what the job just keep your eyes open for other opportunities at all times so John Adams is one of the U.S. founding fathers uh he once said and I'm paraphrasing here that He had to study war and politics so that his children could study maths and philosophy and that their children could study poetry and painting. So this suggests like an ideological future where labour could potentially be automated and people would be free to then just pursue their passions. Do you think that that's still a, a goal that our society should be moving towards? Well, when it comes to automation um, in jobs, I think just to throw this in, um, 
you see a lot in the media about robots are going to take our jobs and they won't. They won't take our jobs. They will take over automation of a lot of jobs, which they already are. Uh, but you, that there's other jobs being created along with that. Uh, so when you were saying about, you know, following your passions, I think the thing here too is with automation, um, as I said, comes other jobs are going to be created because even now there's jobs that we don't even know about that in five years' time will be there. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, if you said about a drone pilot, you would have probably not had an idea what that was all about. Now, that's a job where there's a lot of automation involved, but you still need somebody piloting the thing. So I think in terms of following your passion, if you're very, let's say you're very creative uh, or if you're someone that loves, uh, you know, working with numbers, it's looking at, you know, what where those skills can be used in jobs. And the more automation there is, I think it's actually going to provide a lot more creativity in the types of jobs that are created because you don't have to be solely someone who's about engineering to work um, in an area that might have automation because they might need people who have got a creative side as well, uh, people who um, have got that communication skills. If you think about any industry sector, it's not full of people that are only about accounting or um, only about science. With that automation, um, and as you were saying, you know, for people now to have the chance to focus more on their passions, again, I'd say keep your eyes open and look for opportunities in whatever you're doing at the moment because there's industries that you probably never thought about um, even looking into. But if you go and have a look at the type of jobs in there, you'll be surprised about your interest areas are connected in with a lot of the roles. How effective have government interventions in finding employment for people been? Again, you know, I'll just focus on Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, but I used to work in employment agencies for quite a few years. Uh, working with job seekers. And here in Australia, we have the system in place where people, when they're on uh, government benefits, of course, we've got Centrelink, but the job agencies, uh, the employment agencies was where uh, job seekers that were registered with the government then came in and there were programs in place. Now, with every country that has this, there is a lot of holes in that system still. Um, what I'd probably say is that one thing that I um, particularly picked up on and what I actually followed up on uh, when I went back to uni to do research was looking at that older workforce. Uh, and so that's just one group within the community where when they hit what was 65 at the time, uh, they dropped off the, um, the government payments for that and they went on the pension but not all of them wanted that. They wanted to keep working, but they weren't allowed to access that service anymore. Right. Uh, and, you know, for different reasons, they wanted to keep working. A lot of it was financial, but some of it, they just didn't want to stop. They wanted to be part of the community in that um, workforce. You could be looking at different sectors of uh, the community. Uh, but I think when it comes to, uh, yeah, what's provided um, for people in finding jobs. Um, this is where a lot more career development, and I'm saying that a, a bit of bias because I'm a member of the Career Development Association of Australia, but we're there because we are a body of professionals working in that space, uh, providing career support uh, to people. And I think that needs to be embedded more within government um, and that's all governments, not just here in Australia. Yeah, of course. So basically just working with experts to, to try and increase the opportunities available to people. So you'd say like the older people as a demographic are underutilised by the workforce? Yes, they are. But as I said, there are some programs out there that are being run. Uh, but when it comes to career development, what that really is, is getting people to understand who they are and what they can offer. And 
begin to explore where those opportunities are because if you don't understand who you are and what you can do and that means recognizing all your experience that you've got previously so not just your work experience it can be the skills you've picked up uh, as a parent or in volunteer work that you've done or when you're in high school you know you were involved in sports is that something that people in general are sort of lacking or have difficulty with recognizing their strengths and experiences and how that can be applied to their careers yes uh, that's it's a big thing um because usually when someone is looking for a job, it's a stressful time. And um, the number of times that I've seen someone, when they've put a resume together, they've quickly thrown something together because it's like, well, you know, I need a resume and they'll send it out. But when you're looking for a job, what can take a lot of the stress off you is if you have that understanding of where you're actually going with this. Are you just randomly sending out your resume to 100 different employers? Do you know why you're actually sending that resume to that employer? Uh, Because you might not want to work for them. The job might not be suitable for you. As you were saying earlier, from an inclusive point of view, it might not be something you physically can handle. Capable, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So you need to understand what, you know, who you are, what you enjoy doing, what you can do, what you might need to go and do if there is study that you thought I've always wanted to go and do an apprenticeship or I've always wanted to go and get my certificate three in childcare. Um, why do you want that? You know, is that the, the type of work you're wanting? Um, and then start investigating that industry sector. Get an idea of what's actually happening out there, what's available, who the employers are. And at least then when you're putting your resume together and sending it out, you've got a target. And and an employer is going to ask, why did you apply for this job? It's really hard if you just go, I just randomly send it to you. It's, yeah. It's, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. If you can go, it's because I really am interested in these areas. Um, And so that's what career support is. And so that's why it's so important. And that's the thing I believe needs to be stronger with government programs. That conflicts at a policy level with the current government's approach, which tends to be more job seekers are punished if they don't search for a certain amount of jobs or if they don't accept any job offered to them, even if they aren't necessarily suited to it, et cetera. That's been happening for a long time and it was happening when I was in the sector. The number of resumes you have to send out has increased since I was involved and it was not, something that I never felt comfortable about, hence why I left and, and decided yep. to go to university and, and start focusing on my studies and research in that career development space. It is about the system at this point in time, and as I said for a while, has required people to hit a certain amount that they must do each um, week, each month to show that they are engaged with their job search. And again, this is where um, the pressure that's put on people for that, it's not healthy and it's not productive. Right. Um, And it's not helping the employers either because they're getting sick of being completely flooded with hundreds of resumes where those resumes, you know, most of the time, the person who sent it probably can't even remember sending it to them because it was one of, 40 that they had to send out yeah yes um so no it's not a a system that's working and that's happened across there's a few countries i know that have done similar things again this is where all i can say is career development needs to be there because even if people are expected to send out x amount of resumes i mean I, i can't say how to fix that policy at this point it's definitely something to make a lot of noise about. You can drag your soapbox out and really make a lot of noise about that. Um, but I think to ensure that people aren't just randomly sending stuff out, they need to have that career support, whether they're in that program or they're externally just sending out resumes. Because people who are out there actively looking for work who aren't in that um, system uh, are still sending out you know, hundreds of resumes And um, you might have had people say this to you as well, is that where they've gone, I've sent out hundreds and I've never had a hit. Yeah. And I know it it can make you incredibly despondent, but 
the thing is to stop and go, who are you sending it to? Um, you know, it's about getting a plan of attack and getting to know who the employers are. Yeah, yeah. So it's about really finding a better match between employer and employee so that they're each going to meet each other's yes. needs. Yeah. Yes, that- yes, definitely. And, you know, investigating employers, even being able to reach out to someone who is in that place that you want to go to, to find out a little bit what we call occupational research, where you're talking to someone who's in that industry sector or even in that company that you're looking at and asking them some questions just about, you know, what is involved in this? Because one way um, they talk about the hidden job market and all that means is that instead of only sending your resume out for jobs you're seeing advertised, which, of course, if it's on one of the big um, online job search sites, you're up against a tidal wave of people yeah, of who course. are all going for it. But if you get to know an employer and even have the opportunity to say hello and introduce yourself, there's a lot of times where they'll say, flick me your resume and you can get it on their desk and they haven't even been advertising for a role. So that's what it's all about, keeping your eyes open and just looking for opportunities and connecting with people and letting them know that you're there and this is what you're offering. Sort of learning to recognise those opportunities as well as, as exactly. employment yes. opportunities, yeah. Yes. Mm. Of course. <clears throat> I'm on my soapbox, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's, it's great. Are there any examples of governments that have actually, that, that you think have gotten it right in that policy level? A lot of countries are definitely wanting to because they're wanting a, a stable workforce and we, I'd even go back to, it's a little country, but it's at the top of the list for inclusive workforce. And that's Iceland because of the fact that they open it up to all ages uh, and they do encourage a lot of that diversity in their workforce. But of course, they're, they're a small country. So, you know, they're wanting to keep that productivity going. And we have an aging population. Every country has got an aging population. Uh, so you're not wanting to lose those skills, um, you know, for those that want to continue working. Uh, yeah. So I think from a, um, and I could easily get on my soapbox about this because this is one of those areas, but I would just say is that I think with countries, they're all aware that they have an ageing population. Um, they're all aware that um, COVID for the last two years has impacted on their workforce and people are starting to consider what they want to do as well. Uh, and also there's some industries that haven't started up again yet. So, mm-hmm. of course, that's impacting. So, you know, there's unemployment uh, that's hit every country uh, and a lot of businesses have been impacted. A lot of businesses have shut down. Uh, but I think this is the time for governments to be looking at, well, we need that productivity, but we're also needing to keep people in the workforce. Um, so I think decent work's really going to factor in with this. And I, I would say it's going to be interesting to read what comes through in reports over the next year or two by the UN about that SDG of decent work. Yeah, to see how that's actually improved and how it's been impacted even just Definitely. By, by COVID and the, the fallout, basically. I, I think that that's, yeah, we, we've got a little bit over time, so that, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> um, so we'll... we'll wrap that up here but thank you so much for joining me today that that's really it's been great talking to you and I think I've learned a lot and hopefully our listeners will find it as interesting as I did thank you so much Rebecca and um yes I'm sorry I did drag out the soap no, that- a couple of times there uh but look thank you it was great to have a chat to you yeah it's great to talk to you